Welcome back everybody. Today we'll be looking at another dynamics problem and the problem states that the 15 pound box slides down the curved ramp with a coefficient of friction of kinetic friction is 0.1. If at the instant it reaches point A, it has a speed of 7 feet per second, determine the normal force on the box and the rate of increase of its speed. So with any dynamics problem, it's always best to define a free body diagram. So we're going to look at this point A and we're going to treat the box as a particle. So we're going to look at this free body diagram at the point A. So let's draw the forces acting on this particle. Since this is on a surface, there is going to be a normal force which is perpendicular to the surface itself. So that's going to be pointing in this direction in general. We don't know where it points, but in general, we know it points somewhere around there. Therefore, uh, the other forces acting on the object is going to be the weight, since it does have some mass. And since the object is going in this direction of motion, therefore, the frictional force is going to point in the opposite direction, which is tangent to the surface itself. So this is going to be in this direction. This is going to be the frictional Force. So what we're going to do, do is define this way. This is going to be our positive normal direction. So this is going to be normal. And this is going to be our positive tangential direction. So one problem arises is not knowing what direction the normal force is acting. So to do that, uh, what we're going to have to look at is the concept of slope or how we can relate this angle, so let's draw this out. We can say that if we draw this out, which is tangent to, uh, the, uh, to the surface, we could say that this angle right here, I'm going to call it phi, this angle phi, if we know that angle, we can define this angle right here, which will define the direction of the normal force. So if we go back to our fundamental concept in ca calculus, we could actually look at the tangent line to this point. So this is going to be the tangent line. So if I continue the x-axis, we can define this angle phi in terms of dy dx, which is going to be this right triangle right here. So since we have the equation of the line, uh, or the curve, which is going to be y equals ax squared, where a, a is not defined. I forgot about that again. So this is going to be 1 over 5. So the equation is going to equal y equals 1 fifth x squared. I forgot to uh, write that out. By knowing that equation, we can develop the derivative at this point and find the slope and therefore find the angle at which this slope makes with the horizontal axis. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to define y. So y equals ax squared. We're going to find the derivative. So that's going to be dy dx. That's going to simply equal 2ax. And later on, we're going to need the second derivative. And I'll explain why we're going to need it later. So this is going to be the second derivative, which is simply 2a. So now to find the slope at this given point, we have to plug in the x value for that point a. So we have to plug in dy dx evaluated at x equals. So in this uh, problem, x equals 4 feet, but we got to recognize that this is the negative value of the x-axis. Although it doesn't actually make a difference since the equation is symmetric about the y-axis, it technically does not make a difference, but we want to be rigorous to an extent. We're going to define this uh, position in the negative x direction. Therefore, this value of 4 is actually negative. So this is going to be negative 4. So if we plug in the values, what we're going to get is negative 8 over 5. And then we'll do the same thing for uh, the second derivative. Again, we'll, we'll see why we need the second derivative a little bit later. And again, we plug in a negative value, which does not matter because um, the second derivative is constant. So that's going to be 2 over 5. So now that we know that, we can create a right triangle to find that angle phi. So if we look at this angle, so this is going to be phi, and this is going to be that point A. Um, we can look at the ratio of the vertical and horizontal legs of this triangle to find that angle. So we could say that the, the tangent of phi is equal to dy dx, 
at x equals d, which is negative 4 feet. So we could say that this, we can uh, define the angle phi as the arc tangent of negative 8 over 5. And what we get is negative 57.995 degrees. So the main confusion in this problem is probably why do we get a negative answer? Now, if you plug in a, a positive value for x, you would have gotten a positive 57.995 degrees and everything would have been fine. But if you were rigorous, you would point, point out, it would point out that this is a negative angle. And what that means is that we're using the positive x-axis as our reference point. And therefore, the positive orientation in terms of angles is going to be from the positive x-axis and rotate counterclockwise towards the y-axis as the positive angle um, that we calculate. So when we get a negative answer for the angle, what we're actually doing is doing the opposite. We're rotating in the positive or in the clockwise direction. So we're rotating in this direction instead. So this angle right here is actually phi and there'll be a positive 57.995 degrees. And the reason why we can say it's positive is that we're accounting for that negative sign by rotating clockwise. So from there, we can use a geometric property of vertical angles to define this angle phi over here, which is congruent with our, or our diagram of this right triangle. So therefore, the angle phi is simply just 57.995 degrees. If you didn't account for that negative sign, you would have gotten the same answer and everything would have been fine. But if you were rigorous, you might know, notice this discrepancy and have to realize why we have to, how, how do we account for that negative sign? So we have a phi defined. Now we could actually do the sum of the forces because we have our diagram right here and we could just sum the forces and find that normal force. So um, I'm trying to keep the free body diagram in view. So we're going to sum the forces in the normal direction, and we're going to call this direction positive, as we did earlier. And uh, we're going to say that this is going to equal the normal force minus the weight force. So this is going to be W times the cosine of phi. And this is going to be equal to the mass times acceleration in the normal direction. And again, if you have any particle that's moving along a curve that is changing with time, there must be an acceleration regardless if the particle is moving at a constant velocity. Uh, so uh, we have to equate this equation in terms of the normal acceleration. So the normal acceleration we can, uh, we can think of as at that given point, we could, so this is going to be the curve, and at some given point we can uh, find a radius of curvature, or in other words, a circle tangent to that curve, and we could uh, calculate that radius and find the centripetal acceleration relative to this circle, AC. By using that, we could define the normal acceleration as the velocity at A squared divided by the radius, which is going to be rho. Rho is the radius of curvature at that given point. So to find the radius of curvature, we have to use that complicated looking equation. So the radius of curvature is defined as one plus the derivative with respect to x quantity squared. And all this is raised to three halves power divided by the magnitude of the second derivative. And all this is evaluated at that given point, which is going to be x equals negative 4. So that's why we calculated uh, the second derivative earlier, because we're going to need it to find the radius of curvature. So if you plug in these values, what you're going to get is uh, 16.792 feet. So that means at that given point A, the radius of this tangent circle is going to be 16.792 feet. So now to find the normal force, all we have to do is manipulate this equation. So we're going to get m times the velocity of a squared divided by the radius of curvature plus the weight cosine of phi. So if we plug in some values, we get the mass, which is going to be 15, which is the weight of the object, divided by 32.2, which is gravity in the US customary units. 
So that gives us slugs. And then we're going to multiply this by the velocity. So the velocity is 7 feet per second. So this is going to be 49 divided by the radius of curvature, 16.792. 15, which is the weight force in pounds, uh, times the cosine of the angle, which is 57 0.995 degrees. So make sure you're using um, mass instead of weight. And to do that, you always divide by the acceleration due to gravity. So since we're in the US system, we're going to use 32.2. And the weight is in terms of pounds. So the normal force is equal to 9.309 pounds. So that is the normal force acting on the object at point A. So the next part of the problem is uh, to determine the rate of increase of its speed. The thing we have to do is actually analyze the problem in the tangential direction now. And to do that, all we simply have to do is sum the forces in the tangential direction and find the acceleration vector. And then from there, to find the rate of increase of the speed, we just take the magnitudes of the acceleration vector, meaning we take the square of the normal and tangential acceleration vectors and add them together and then square root it to get the magnitude, and that will be our final answer. So I redrew the diagram, and all we're going to do is sum the forces in the tangential direction. So that should be pretty straightforward. So if we sum the forces in the tangential direction where this direction is positive, we're going to get um, W sine of phi minus the frictional force Fk, and that's going to be M times the acceleration in the tangential direction. So um, the first thing is to define the frictional force. So Fk is simply the kinetic friction times the normal force at A. And we found the normal force in the previous part of this problem. So if we plug that in, we get M sine of phi minus mu k times n equals m times a. So all we have to do is divide by mass and find the acceleration in the tangential direction. And from this equation, we'll just plug in the values and solve for the acceleration in the tangential direction. And what we get for the acceleration in the tangential direction is going to be 25.307 feet per second squared. So to define the acceleration, the magnitude of the acceleration of the particle, um, let me draw a diagram to explain it. So we're going to have an acceleration vector pointing in the positive direction. And the reason why it's positive are, uh, is because we got a positive value for the tangential vector. So we could say that this is going to be AT. And it's going to also have a normal component, which we found earlier. And the reason why is because the object is rotating um, or going along a curve. Therefore, if you add these two vectors together, you're going to get some vector over here. So this is going to be A. So our goal of the second part of this problem is to find the magnitude of this vector. So to find the magnitude of A, all we do is take AT squared plus AN squared and square root it. And that will give you the rate of change of the particle speed at that given moment at A. So we can plug in some values. And what we get for the acceleration magnitude is going to be 25.475 feet per second squared. So the hardest thing about this problem is probably understanding the geometry of the problem. And what I'm saying is understanding the relationship of calculus to um, the geometric meanings of calculus. So uh, the derivative of y with respect to x gives you a slope, and we can relate that slope in terms of an angle relative to the x-axis. So understanding that relationship, we can define the free body diagram and sum the forces to find what we're looking for. Beyond that, the another difficult thing to understand possibly is understanding that if a particle is moving along a curve, and the curve is not straight, the particle is accelerating regardless if it is going at a velocity, uh, at a constant velocity. So recognizing that, we could say that the sum of the forces in the normal direction is going to equal some acceleration in the normal direction, and that is dependent on the particle's um, path of curvature. And uh, you could see that right here. So always remember, if a particle is curving or rotating, 
then it does have some sort of acceleration. And then uh, finally, it's not necessarily a hard concept, but just to remember fundamentally what it means in turn, uh, what a vector means in terms of its magnitude. So if we're trying to find the magnitude of acceleration, we have to do this geometric property of, of summing the vectors and finding the magnitude of that resultant vector by using trigonometry or using a right triangle. So just don't forget that um, to find the magnitude, you always square the components and then take the square root of the addition of those squared components. And also, it's kind of tricky in the problem you might be feeling. If it, this was an exam, you might be uh, rushed in some sense, and you might forget that extra tidbit of finding the magnitude of the acceleration vector instead of finding the magnitude of each component of the acceleration vector. So just remember that very small thing. So with that being said, I'll see you in the next video.